Welcome to the Dallas Design Sprints podcast. My name is Robert Scrove. On today's show, we're going to be featuring Dan Levy. He's the principal of More Space for Light, an Australian-based consultancy that specializes in strategy, user experience, design sprint training, and facilitation. I had a wonderful conversation with Dan about how he's grown the business, his current partnership with Design Sprint Academy, and what he's planning on for the coming year, including the conferences he'll be at and the training he's going to be holding very shortly. Hope you enjoy the conversation, and we'll see you on the other side. So Dan Levy, very nice of you to join me on the Dallas Design Sprints podcast. I know it's really early for you out there, but I really appreciate you coming online and talking. Good morning, Robert. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'd like to jump right into how you came around to starting this company, um, how you've evolved it over time, and you know where you are today and what you're looking to move forward with. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, well, we've been around for three years now, almost at our third year, a three-year anniversary. And um, so when I started More Space, um, I didn't see anybody in the market doing what we were doing locally in Adelaide. And to me, I found that frustrating because um, I'm a digital kid. I love building things and and I, I, I was in the advertising industry and I was fed up with every solution being a website, especially when you read things like TechCrunch and The Verge and you can just see so many amazing things going on. Now, at this time when I started More Space, I didn't really, um, I didn't really understand how mature the startup space was in Adelaide as well. So it was, it was you know... It, I, I've learned over time and initially when I started, my whole uh, premise was about building user experience agency, about helping organizations organize their stuff and ladder it back to their business strategy in terms of what they're trying to achieve. Also on a personal level, um, I we were having our second, our youngest uh, just about to have our youngest, and I wanted to take a bit more control of my life. I was reading a book by um, Vince Frost called Design Your Life, mm-hmm. and one of the things I was looking to do was to, to design my life, and, and foolishly, I figured that by running my own thing, I'd have more time to do what I like. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that, that really hasn't been the case for most of the things, because as you know, if you're about to start something new and you're about to start a business, you have to you have to really grind and really have to kind of wade through the dirt to get to a place where you can find the light. Um, and finally, in regards to the name, the name came from my youngest, uh, no, sorry, my eldest Max. And one night I was like, as I am a designer by heart. Uh, uh, Originally, when I launched into the creative services industry, I couldn't start anything unless I had a logo or a brand name. So I was I was like fishing around, coming up with names. And one night, I was putting my young my sorry my eldest to bed, and he turned around to me and said, "Daddy, I, w- I don't want to go to sleep yet. I want more space for light." And I turned around to my wife and I was like, "What does what does that mean?" And she explained to me it meant that he wanted more time to play, he wanted more time to read, and that was. That was it. It hit me like a ton of bricks. So after I finished uh, wiping the tears from my eyes because it was so profound, so simple and so profound, that was it for me. I went and registered the name and realized I had the name, I had an idea of a brand mark, ready to go. Like that's it. I don't need a business plan. I've got I've got a brand name. It's <laughs> really interesting. I and do you just out of curiosity, do you kind of tell that story slightly when you're first introducing the company or is it part of your introduction to your clients and to people that work with you? It depends. I, I, um, sometimes I do because I, I think it's linked to our whole philosophy and the genesis of where more space comes from. Cause it's all about organizations are very much stuck where they are like the people that we talk to in, in regards to the silos and trying to get stuff done and trying to achieve their business objectives. So it's, it is a metaphor for what they're trying to achieve. It's also a metaphor personally for me, in my life trying to find, trying to do the right thing. It's like our North star the light. So, Initially, they're very much about, you know, what do you do? But as the conversation develops, then people, people always ask about the name. And that's when I share it with them. Interesting. And usually at that point, it's, 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 
you know, as soon as somebody hears that name, generally what, and I tell the story behind it, they, they relax and, you know, they, 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 they're a lot more open because they can see um, it almost indicates how genuine we are and our intention, you know, like we were trying to do the right thing. I see. No, it makes sense to me. When you first started, uh, how did you figure out your audience? How did you know who would, who would be what your message around your company and what you did with design sprints in Adelaide and, and beyond? How did you kind of factor in who your client yeah. base, and who the audience were? Do you, do you know what? That's one of the biggest questions. Who, when I was uh, when I was first starting more space was who, who is your audience and and I'll, I'll be frank with you um, it was anyone that would pay because <laughs> I had to put food on the table <laughs> um, most probably design sprints for us and um, where we've shifted the business towards um, so so we've learned about where our place is over the last 18 months. And we've shifted the business to focus more on the ideation, inclusive design, and um, using design tools and design thinking to be able to talk to businesses about their business strategies. We've never really, un I'll, I'll circle back to your answer in a moment, but we've never really felt comfortable talking to CEOs um, in regards to, uh, business strategy and how that relates to marketing strategy and building stuff. And what I slowly found when I discovered the design sprint program was that I had a format and, and we could feel comfortable as a business to be able to have that conversation because we had a tool set that we could use to talk to CEOs and help them understand how they could get things done. Now the nature of the design sprint itself, because it isn't, um, because it's very intensive and because in that regard, it's not a, um, a cheap product because, you know, it takes a lot of time and that. Um, it kind of defined the type of organizations that we started to work with. For example, banks, uh, government, um, uh, big health companies. And, and so that's slowly we've started to find our niche in that world. Uh, yeah, and I have a similar experience too. I mean, I'm eight months in and it's it, it's weird because it's kind of contextual to the location I'm in. So I'm in Dallas, Fort Worth. Yeah. And lately, the clientele that I've been attracting have been Indian IT firms or uh, Indian or Asian based companies that are very developer centric and that are spread out across the globe. Yet they want to understand the uh, the benefits of both UX and inclusive design as part of their their cultural makeup or even how they they correspond to their projects. So it's been, it's been relatively interesting thinking of who I thought my audience was, but then when the reality came around to actually finding gainful contracts, it's been slightly different, even though I've, I'm getting like really good reception across the board. Um, That's cool. So with, uh, with, so one of the things I know about what you do is you work with Design Sprint Academy and I think it's John Vatan who does that, correct? That's that, correct, yes. John and Dana. How did, uh, yeah, and Dana too. How did the, the two of you get together? And what was the, what was the origin of how, when you decided to start working together? It was quite organic, actually, um, Robert. We start, as you know, the, the, the community itself is, is really supportive, is really strong, as you would have seen with the virtual design sprint that you organized. Um, I started talking to John almost at the beginning of the year. I had a design sprint coming up and it was for a big company. Um, it wasn't necessarily for a product. It was for a project in respect of they were trying to plan out their project roadmap. And I was stuck. I, I really didn't see how I could use this tool to be able to um, help them define their roadmap. And John and I had a good conversation and we just kept that going, kept that dialogue going. And John saw an opportunity in Australia because the market itself is um, it's very fresh, hasn't really embraced the program yet. And Australia is typically, and I hope the people that listen to this don't take offense to this, but Australia is typically a little bit late when adopting new philosophies, new technologies in the respect of um, like something like design sprints. And he saw it as an opportunity and we, 
oh, we developed a relationship, talking quite a lot, him coaching me and coaching my team. And uh, we decided to basically give it a go, give it a whirl, see what happened. And um, that was formalized in around um, in July. And then I, I went and visited the team in Berlin and uh, participated in some of their training. And then recently, John flew over to Australia and helped us launch the brand officially in Australia with some training. Hmm. Interesting. So is, is what John does with DSA, does that, that correlate to your offerings with local clientele there or as part of what you offer? Or is this kind of like an extension where both of you promote each other's, each other's services? So we, we basically promote uh, their products. So they, they've basically re-engineered the Design Sprint, uh, not, not referring to Design Sprint 2.0, but the original Design Sprint. Mm-hmm. And, um, so, and they've created a whole innovation framework around that. And so we basically use that program and they promote us as a, uh, as a, a global partner. And have you found that the reception to your business has changed because of that partnership or it's, you, you had mentioned earlier that you, you were going to be involved with some training in February. You've got a pause fest coming up. Um, are, did that partnership kind of lead to those, those results or has it been that plus some organic growth within the company that's, that's allowed you to have these uh, opportunities? I, I, I'll be honest with you, it's partnering with Design Sprint Academy has basically bootstrapped our company. So we, we're in Adelaide, we're based in Adelaide because of, you know, it's because of our family, my family, my wife and kids. It's a great place for the family to, um, you know, afford a nice house and every, everything like that. So we, we're not in Sydney, which are the main areas, in which case being in Adelaide, you don't get much of a you don't get as much exposure so it's a little bit tougher to compete in the market and bootstrapping and associating ourselves with design sprint academy was fantastic because we basically bootstrapped ourselves and uh, made us and and gave ourselves a bigger you know bigger brand equity dan would you want to pause here and go take a go see how your kids are doing no, no, they're, they're good. I can hear them stomping about. You'll hear, you'll hear the door slide open in a minute. You could hear me stab a bit because I'm, I'm waiting for the, bo- the door to slide open by two-year-old to say, good morning, daddy. Because we're, we're going to see Santa today. So we're going to the, there's a place called the Magic Cave in Adelaide and we're going to take the kids to see Santa. So I've been telling them to prepare their Christmas lists. <laughs> so there's a lot of excitement in the house. We're putting up the Christmas tree as well today. So yeah, there's a lot of excitement in our house at the moment. <laughs> That's awesome. Mm. Um, okay. So now I'm, now I'm thinking of my own kid because uh, we, he's, um, he's, we're, there's a healthy debate as to whether, whether Santa actually exists over here. So I've come in, I've come in and Santa costumes and he's seen Santa elsewhere. So I've tried to, to promote it as that I'm an agent of Santa. I'm not really, I'm part of his crew and not necessarily the person that, that, that operates everything. So I tried to use the networking angle. I don't know if I sold that correctly to him, but I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to figure it out this year, whether or not he feels that the presents are coming from, from him or they're coming from other family members. So we'll have to figure that out. Ah, oh, it's tough. Is that your six-year-old? Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, you got you weave lies as parents. So I had this one going for a while where I convinced my kids that they had to brush their teeth because the fairies use their teeth. Their teeth had to be healthy because the fairies use their teeth to build the um, the factory that Santa's elves make the Christmas toys in. So they have to make sure their teeth are good and that they brush their teeth and, and you know, the, the fairies use their teeth in cri- at Christmas time to guide Santa's sleigh to our house. So they have to be clean and white. So some of the bullshit, so I won't swear, but you know, <laughs> as a parent, you have, to be, you have to be creative in what you come up with. Cause the narrative, the, the more interesting the narrative is and the more out there it is, usually you can, you know, 
you can you can really get them. <laughs> well, now, <laughs> I, now I'm picturing Santa's kingdom is made of nothing but children's teeth. <laughs> that's a bit frightening, isn't it? So, yeah. When you when you think of it like that, as I'm saying, it does make it seem a bit creepy. But, um, <laughs> but if you can if you if you can link this network as broad as possible you're not just getting those bribes. You're not just succeeding with those bribes in December. You have to think holistically for the whole 12 months. So you have to leverage all of the whole network of whether it's the, 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 the fairies or whatever else you can. You've got to get more working together. Yeah, I, I definitely need to be more creative, but I don't think I'm going to top. Uh, I really don't think I'm going to top a Christmas kingdom that's, that has, that's full of molars and bicuspids. It's just not I don't think I can ever go that far. But uh, all the same, hey. Well, I wish you luck. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Okay, so moving from that, let's talk about 2019. Um, I think I may mention of the, of the let's, let's talk pause fest. So uh, what do you got lined up for that? Is this going to be a, a kind of an engagement similar to what you do with DSA where there's going to be some training involved? Are you presenting? Uh, what do you have lined up for that, for that conference? So we've, developed a we've developed a, a mini workshop that basically allows participants to experience what it's like to be in a design sprint it's different to the the lightning decision jam so we use things like empathy maps the whole idea is it's built around the challenge and gets an organization or participants to think a little bit differently about how they'd approach a challenge so we don't focus on um ranking challenges it's around coming up with a particular challenge and then giving it a flavor of another company so they can think a bit differently and get out of their box so i'm using that particular product and we've been rolling this product out in the respect of practicing with other organizations and it's and it's worked for both of us in the respect of these organizations are quite curious of what a design sprint is and it's a very light touch 60 to 90 minute workshop that gets them thinking and gets some experience in it and also gives us an opportunity to promote what that way of working and thinking is so we're going to be taking that to pause fest this year and we've got a couple of um, workshops in the lead up so we can so we can practice and we can you know get it really good really tight for when we go there does it does that workshop or that engagement require any um any contact with potential attendees on what they, what kind of challenges they would like, or is, is the challenge kind of baked into the presentation you'll be doing at CrossFest? The challenge is baked into the presentation. So we have a particular type of challenge that we use, and it's something that, you know, everybody can relate to. Okay. Interesting. It's really cool. Cause so we ran this, um, we ran this workshop last week or two weeks ago. And we ran it for a, a meetup called Agile Adelaide. So I was terrified of going in because, you know, using the term sprint with all these guys that are fluent in Scrum and Agile methodology, you can just imagine that here I come, design sprint, what does this all mean? And we had 80 participants and I had, um, it was about, I think there was about eight to 10 teams and they were all doing empathy maps and all sorts, and they loved it. So it's been validated in en masse. Oh, it's really interesting. I, I, it's, I sometimes take a page from Bill Alexi, uh, the, folk, the, the local Fort Worth uh, facilitator that I know of. Um, and I worked with him on a sprint before, and one of the things he did was use common language when describing not only the activities in the design sprint, but the design sprint itself. He avoided some of the nomenclature not to, to not confuse someone from a development background who's yeah. familiar with Scrum and Agile. And the interesting thing is, is that he, if I recall correctly, he used to ask different people, if you could describe what we had just done, um, what, would you, you know, what would you call it? I don't recall the answers because I wasn't part of the conversation, but that could be a different way, especially if people are, like I have encountered this too. When I say sprint, they say, oh, you mean like rapid agile? And I'm like, no, not quite. Could be similar, but not, not, not the same thing. Yeah. So I well, I always think, I don't think in term. so I don't think anybody owns the term sprint, but when I think of a design sprint, I always think of a beginning and an end and the end always being that validation with users. And I, and what I've observed over the last few months is, um, 
some companies talking about design sprints, whether it be in a day or whatever, but they're just really talking about a workshop, a, uh, an innovation workshop or a requirements workshop. So I'm, I'm quite strict when I use the term sprint in the, res- the, the five phases. It doesn't matter how many days, that the fact that the sprint actually uses though all five phases of the understand, the ideation, the, the, the decision, the build, and the, the final validation. So I'm very, you know, I, I impress upon people when I talk to them about that design sprint that it is a process. Yeah, and, I, and something interesting that I've been noticing, and this, this probably dovetails a little bit into other topics like growth design and, uh, and code sprints that I've seen or like New Haircut does with theirs, it feels like ever since the design sprint process came out, it's been the, the base recipe for other people to kind of iterate or experiment with. You have McKinsey doing concept sprints. You have uh, Mike, Michael Margolis doing his own research sprint. You have uh, the, people, the people that we know in innovation hackers like Sabrina Gorich up in Stuttgart who's doing brain sprints. It feels like once you understand the, the baseline process, you're free to kind of manipulate and manipulate it and change it based on context, outcomes, audience, and uh, awareness of other complementary processes that would help derive the kind of information you're looking to get. Similar to how you and, and John have worked out, worked out your process, you've, he's optimized 1.0, but he's done it in such a way so it makes sense for what he sees in his, in his vision probably as uh, an optimized process that gets to real tangible results. I mean, what's your take on that? I, I absolutely agree, but I, I take it one stage further. I, actually, I, I impress upon people that it's also something that can be atomized and each activity can be used independently. So something that, um, that, uh, that I realized as I started to embrace design sprints, because very much from the beginning when we, when we started, I, I intentionally didn't want to be pigeonholed into a particular type of technology. And I wanted to take that step back to be able to explore new technologies and using things like design sprints. What I've found is that um, it's actually around the people and the culture less than the actual um, product itself. And, and it's a, once you start thinking of the, the sprint itself as a, as a problem solving process, and each tool in itself being of value, you, you can construct anything you like. And, and something we do in our training, something I say to the guys is that you, you can really take away one little thing and use it to demonstrate uh, or, or to get to an outcome very easily. And once you start thinking of it like that, it, it's not just around a product or, you know, or, or coming out with a particular outcome. It's actually coming up with a decision. So there's different things that you can cherry pick. Once you start cherry picking and understanding how things can link together, um, you can start remixing and building your own products from that. And sometimes it's necessarily a design sprint. Yeah. And sometimes you just need an advocate or somebody who's familiar, familiar enough with the process to go in that direction. I mean, yeah, and we've, we've been doing that. So I, I, we've been doing it heaps here mm-hmm. just because getting people to commit to that. Sorry, Robert, I didn't mean to I, I'm, I apologize for interrupting you. Um, we, we've just been doing that because uh, one of the biggest barriers or blockers for design sprints we found is that time, that investment of time. And I know from a broader perspective, people talk about, okay, you know, four days compared to six months is just is absolute gold but trying to convey that to execs and people like that's very difficult so you need to be able to do that and that's where that 90 minute workshop comes from that's where things like lightning decision jam comes from where people can actually use a concentrated amount of time to demonstrate an outcome and once you see that from a broader perspective you can see that um, each tool in itself which obviously wasn't invented by the design sprint comes from other ideation type workshops are really powerful and then you once you break it down atomize it you can rebuild it and remix it yeah and here's something i and this is actually one of the, the pieces i've been thinking about writing an article about 
is that if you look at all those different activities, they can be like, like the LDJ, like the Lightning Decision Jam, you can take them individually and use them for particular situations. For example, the, the effort impact scale is used in Agile, it's used in other, in other processes. But one thing, I, one way I've seen it work effectively well, and I do this myself, is uh, personal planning, uh, like a to-do list that you have at the beginning yeah. of the week. And running a list of 20 to-dos through an effort impact scale and knowing if you finish that upper left quadrant and get that knocked out by Wednesday, you can consider your week of a job well done, or at least that you're, you're mostly successful. The rest of it is just a matter of getting into it when you have time. Um, another thing I've seen is the Tuesday sketch sessions, like the four-step sketch and the skit sticky decision. Uh, depending on the, like who you're talking to, like if it's a design dev group and they want to power through a particular process or get some ideation down, that's a perfect container for doing that. And it feels like there's other things related to either problem framing or to the Monday sessions where you don't have to have the four day engagement, but if you want to sample or taste different aspects of the design sprint contextual to your situation or what you want to have as an outcome, you can do that. It's just a matter of understanding which of those ones to kind of, like to your point, um, itemize or autonomize and put into uh, a process, even if it's a small one. Absolutely, and, and also that's how we got into design sprints because we couldn't, we just couldn't get people to commit to the time. And I was interested in running them. So we were with one of the, uh, we were with the government agency and I had the book in my desk. We were working with these, sorry, so let me, let me start again. So we were working with the government agency and I just bought the book and I was just running different parts of it to validate it. I'm testing and validating the design sprint with a client with different parts of it until I got to the point where I could see it, prove that it worked. And then I was able to have, have the confidence to actually sell it into clients. So I, I started right from the beginning, just using different parts of it to build that confidence. An interesting selling point too with the design sprint that is one of those things I've seen written about and it's, it's, it's put in decks. But one of the, some of the intangibles that really make it sing are the fact that there's a sense of camaraderie that comes from an engagement that's longer than a day where everyone's concentrating on the same problem and not being pulled in different directions. If it's longer than a day, maybe two or three days, then you really start to have uh, the notion of a shared experience and the feeling of what you had mentioned before about inclusion, about bringing people in so that everyone's voice is heard, but just in different, different, uh, different ways. Um, the same thing with with being on the same page about you know why they're all there to to begin with and what the opportunity is and one of the ch biggest challenges for design sprints is to capture that inspiration and uh put it in an operational or execution sense so that you have a path forward you have a plan you have something to in the next two to four weeks that you concentrate on it's almost like you put the design sprint itself through an effort impact scale and figure out out of the prototype and what people have built or, or experimented with what you can meaningfully take forward once we go everyone goes back to their regular routines yeah i 100 percent agree I, I, and at the very least at a minimum each participant has empathy and understands the you know what each individual department's kpis are and what they're trying to achieve and where their bias is so when at least when they step away, they see where they are on that overall service map. Also, some people that are further down the chain that don't get that exposure to customers for the first time that they actually understand the context of what they're doing in the real world. So it's quite powerful. So the, the, you know you have the the project outcome, but you also have the the hidden the hidden advantages of that that type of process. So I think the cat cat the camaraderie is just is such a such a big thing and it's really hard to express that because you know from a from an exec level there's not much ROI you know hard ROI behind that but when you see different people that haven't spoken before and you're building a culture of collaboration I mean that's to me that's priceless and that's something I want within more space as well 
And that's probably central to your to your um, to your core message as a company. It aligns yeah. with it very well, I believe. Yeah. So what are some of the challenges that you've encountered uh, in your journey with design sprints and kind of uh, building out your company, especially with the process? I imagine they are similar to what I've heard from other uh, other folks that are in the space. But what have you encountered? What's been your experience? So we, we haven't, um, so we, we've taken two tracks. The first track was um, building brand equity in the market. So, uh, and with the training, the first set of training we did last year with, oh, this, sorry, this year with Design Sprint Academy, it forced us to um, up our game in terms of what we were doing on social, uh, on building newsletters and things like that. So that, that was the first thing, because when we went prior to that, we really had, um, we really didn't, we weren't making much noise in the market. So it helped us do that. And once we built that platform, we had some form of credibility in the market. That was really important for us because there's other established players here. Um, and we needed to, uh, uh, and to be in that space and to have that dialogue around inclusive design and design thinking, we had to, uh, we had to have a bit more credibility than some small agency in a in a you know just some small agency that's just trying to do their thing so we needed to compete on a bigger stage so that's been one of the challenges building the brand also in regards directly in regards to design sprints actually bringing it to market where there isn't a demand so one of the things that we planned in our strategy was trying to build a a groundswell about it uh, uh, to be able to educate the market on the benefits of it on what it is because we're very much in that community. So we see all the videos, we see all the things on Instagram, but I reckon about 80% of the people, maybe even 98% of the people don't know what it is. Don't know the strength of it. So you're trying to build a demand when there's not necessarily a demand there, which is really, really challenging. And at the same time, there could be a plus. I was talking to Abel Menegas yesterday. And he has kind of the same concern is that you know, in the Philippines, where he is, not a lot of people understand or appreciate what the process is. At the same time, it is an opportunity to establish like being the only person in the, in the, on the block that offers that ice cream that everybody feels is delicious. They just have to taste it first. Um, so it kind of maybe it leads into my next question, which is the topic that the team that you were on back in November for the virtual design sprint, the design sprint referral network. Um, I'm currently writing an article about it. I'm, I'm making plans to kind of move forward with it. But my question to you would be from a business standpoint, how would that, if that referral network existed, how could that benefit more space for light into an extension DSA in a way that's meaningful if it, if it was, was created and if it existed? Uh, okay, so I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about the outcome of that virtual design sprint. Um, I'm also reading a book by um, Rand Fishkin called, oh, what is it called? Lost and Founder, which I recommend highly. And um, I've been thinking about how do I take what we're doing one step further and, and, and turn it into a product, if uh, a virtual product, if that's possible. Um, I think what that the whole idea of that network being bigger than the sum of your parts, I, th- I think that the community itself, which is really positive, which is open to collaboration, especially in regards to being able to, um, in Australia, being able to go to different parts of the country and having that network in place to be able to bring in a co-facilitator, I think it's fantastic. So I, I'm, I, that's where I can see it benefiting. A very... First up, from a, for building a community on the, the virtual level, being able to see where other people are at and being able to create some form of parity or being able to see where your strengths are as a facilitator and as a company, but also just being able to go to Brisbane or go to Sydney or even go into Asia and um, be able to see, oh, okay, there's somebody there. So I know I've got a support network there. I've also got somebody that can come in and co-facilitate for me, which means that um, I don't have to charge or have to ask for, you know, up my rates to be able to afford a couple of co-facilitators, their flights, their accommodation. So that's where I see the power of it. 
what what books are you reading? You mentioned a couple of them, but what are, what are you tracking? Are you are you looking at anybody in this design sprint space and kind of like uh, seeing what they're doing or waiting till they they publish something? Or what what are you what are you following? Oh my gosh, my bookshelf. Um, so I just hope those those guys, Jake and and Jonathan. I wish they'd stop recommending bloody books because I just go out and buy them every time. <laughs> so. The, the, the one I'm actually reading at the moment is called Lost and Founder by Rand Fishkin. Uh, he's the founder of Moz. And this book, if you're in the um, startup world, you're in the product, you know, consultancy world, just recommend this enough. Um, this, to me, is like the modern day version of Shoe Dog. Shoe Dog was written by, is a memoir by Phil Knight, the founder of uh, Nike. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. Another amazing book. I'm, I've got The Messy Middle sitting on my bookshelf. I've just bought um, Daniel Stillman's book. He he posted up a, a free audio book on Slack uh, for Thanksgiving. I went and bought it because he's given me so much value. So I'm waiting for that to come through. I've also got um, The Messy Middle, which is sitting on my bookshelf. And um, the Tim Brown books on its way to me that changed by design. So mm -hmm. I've got that one coming because I was listening to a podcast with him the other day and I was just like, how comes I don't own this book? So you, you saw a snapshot of my bookshelf before Robert. So you can see, um, the, I've got quite a few to keep me busy for a while. And, and the, the other one that's really good is, um, I want to get his name right. So I, I, this is like my go-to book. A lot of people go for um, Austin Klein. Dave Trott, his name is, David Trott. And he's got a book called, um, Dave Trott, he's got a book called Predatory Thinking and Creative Mischief. And these are my, like, these are my little, I always revisit these books. They're short stories from the advertising world. All about Can strategy. I, um and those are all those are all great suggestions and uh I'm, I'm i have a couple that you said where i kind of perked my interest i'm like i'm gonna go look those up but i will okay. say one thing in closing about your shelf um when i the first thing that that crossed my mind when i looked at it wasn't the um involved amount of stuff that's on it but that it literally looked like the movie set where someone would come in like a, the protagonist would, would enter the, the the camera looking everywhere looking on the shelf and then finding the one clue that they need to find the next step to tracking like the killer or whatever it is. Like it's, it's like, it's like we finally found it. And then from there it seems with a, re a car racing down the road. And uh, I don't know. Can, can I add to that? So in the context of my life, that scene would play out as follows. So you'd have me creep into the room, uh, look for the book. And as I found the book, I feel a you know, some, you see some sort of success and I'll take a step and you'd hear me scream and yell as I stepped on a piece of Lego, twisted my ankle, <laughs> fallen on the floor and woken up the whole house. So that would be my version of that narrative because on our floor we've got the Avengers, the Avengers, uh, oh gosh, I don't know, one of the, the, the house from the, the Infinity Wars, my six-year-old just got it for his birthday and all sorts of Ninjago and everything like that. So you have to have some form of dexterity. So I used to play soccer, Robert, and I used to be quite light of feet. And I've managed to retain that, um, that agility from dodging uh, Duplo and Lego and things like that in the house. Well, I, have, I used to play basketball a lot. So I, I, whenever I step on my son's Legos or things that he has on the ground, like marbles, because he's big at a marble race, um, yeah. I'll, I'll immediately, almost instinctively collapse my ankle so that if yeah. I know it's going at the wrong angle, I could just simply roll on the ground and make a lot of noise. And, and luckily there's no one watching, but I'll, I'll pick <laughs> that up. Uh, yeah, I, I probably need to clean up the floor because my son sometimes doesn't remember to do so. No, no, I, 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 get, I totally get where you're coming from. It's, yeah, it's like you get to Monday, they're good. By Friday, everyone's got a little bit looser. Yeah, your house looks like somebody just emptied out Lego World all over your house. So. And playdates are, play are great too because basically you just follow the hurricane of activity. So they go from the room, <laughs> throw everything around, and then they, they shout and they run up to the next room. You just kind of clean things up, move things over to the corner, and just follow, follow the, the plastic carnage wherever you can find it in your house. And you save yourself some time later on trying to not have that argument with your six-year-old about you know, cleaning up after himself. Oh, 
yeah, it's a, you never the hurricane of activity. I love it. <laughs> I'm going to use that. <laughs> so Dan, if people are looking to follow you online and see what you're all about, where should they go? Okay, so Medium with more space for light on Medium. We uh, we publish blogs. We publish our newsletter. We I'm hugely prolific on LinkedIn. That's where I live. So that's Dan Levy and more space for light on LinkedIn, but mainly me, that's I publish heaps on there. And also our Instagram feed, which is uh, more space for light. And your training dates that are coming up in February. Do you have those handy? I do. Thank you for asking. So give me one moment. So we've got, um, so we're in Adelaide for two days from the 20th of February. We're then in Sydney, the 25th and 26th of February. And finally, we're in Melbourne, the 28th of February and the 1st of March. Dan Levy, thank you very much for coming on to the Dallas Design Sprints podcast. It was wonderful talking to you. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks again for listening to the Dallas Design Sprints podcast. If you have a question or comment about what you heard on today's show, email me direct at robert at dallasdesignsprints.com. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next time.